the ethnologue lists that there's 7,000 languages that exist in the world, but more than less than half of them are documented and one third of the world's languages are endangered. And half of the population of the world actually only speaks one of 23 languages. And this inequality is indicative of the potential pitfalls for people who don't speak one of those 23 languages. And unfortunately, minoritized speakers often get blamed for possessing their own mother tongue. Just to give one very unfortunate example, a few years ago, a 17-year-old Dutch girl named Vera Moll tragically died during a bungee jumping excursion in Cantabria, Spain. The judge ruled that her death was in part caused by the instructor's poor English, which caused the girl to jump before the rope was tied around her ankle. The instructor said no jump, um, but the judge claimed that it may have been perceived as now jump. Very tragic, terrible story. Uh, and the legal proceedings though indicate to us how English is this particularly strange entity that gets purported as ideo ideologically necessary. Um, never mind that we've seen as evidence in many places, especially the ethnologue here, that there are actually more Spanish speakers than English speakers in the world. And again, remember where we were listening to a, this was a Dutch woman and a Spanish speaking person, maybe assuming that English was that lingua franca there. And this positioning that opposes um, mainstream and minoritized language varieties gets complicated, particularly because language change comes from minoritized speakers such as women, BIPOC or black and indigenous uh, people of color and trans and queer folks of color. Much of the new terms in English, for example, that get bleached in terms of where they come from, you may have heard of them like work, tea, shade, basic, flex, all of these come from either queer or trans people of color or African-American communities, which the average speaker doesn't know because we often don't do deep dives into who and what deserves credit in relationship to language. This year's uh, 2020 Linguistic Society of America's Word of the Year ceremony provides a great example of this. Um, the term and I oop was suggested for Word of the Year, the popularization of which came from Visco Girls on social media. So Visco is an app like Instagram with photos and is really, really trendy. Um, but luckily, there was someone in the audience that pointed out that And I Oop actually originated from a drag queen, Jazz and Masters, in a video in 2015. Five years later, they're talking about adding it to word of the year. So it's so crucial to understand where change comes from and to give credit where credit is due. Thank you, Rachel. So with these uh, foundational definitions and concepts in mind, we turn our attention for the rest of this talk to institutions. So any time that you have to use language, so to sign or write or speak to accomplish a task, linguistic discrimination is at play. And it's at play because our individual positionality determines how much we produce of a given variant and how we perceive the variants being used by others. So as we situate ourselves inside institutions and work to move through them, linguistic discrimination is always operating. So sociolinguistics then is seeking a better understanding of how that negotiation happens in the moment. So we're going to give you about 10 examples of different institutions and how people are trying to negotiate these issues. Great, thanks Kelly. So as Kelly described, the institutions that we are a part of are laden with issues related to language and discrimination. A common institution we all share that I first want to bring up is media. The media space is so broad from television to movies, fiction to nonfiction, and it is a place of large dissemination of language ideologies. We can think of our favorite um, childhood movie, if you want to click Kelly, thank you, um, especially from Disney, where the bad guy characters were often having a foreign accent and the African American English speakers were often played, often ended up playing the almost minstrel characters for comic relief. You can maybe think of Mushu from Mulan for this example. Now, the media has the ability to subvert or broaden the scope regarding who uses specific language features. In some of my, my most recent work uh, with Emily Gasser on the N NBC TV show, The Good Place, we look at character Jason Mendoza's use of dynamic intonational features, such as uptalk. You may hear me using uptalk a lot. I'm a, originally from Southern California. Um, but this is the rising intonation pattern found at the end of declarative utterances to build, um, so, I describe this when we think about Jason from The Good Place, is that he uses Uptalk as one way to build his character as a young Filipino hip hop dancer from Jacksonville, Florida, um, which is perhaps a different um, image than our stereotypical perception of an Uptalk user who might be from Los Angeles, have blonde hair, be a young, vapid white girl or something. 
So beyond fictional characters, Kiesling and Schilling Estes argue that speaker agency can be the driver of style shifting beyond environmental or situational factors. They invoke Bell's de de audience design model, um, which claims that speakers style shift in reaction to perception of audience. In some of my sociophonetic work, I look at black conservative politician Omarosa and her use of segmental um, and super segmental features that are used together in discourse um, to make up her mediatized persona that draw on both racialized and gendered indexes. Um, you may um, recognize Omarosa, she was on The Apprentice and she was also working in the Trump White House um, for about a year before she left in 2017. Audience design can help explain Omarosa's feature choice with respect to uh, language use, perhaps in the pursuit of gaining fame, notoriety, and in more recent years, allegiance with a target audience, that being the Black community, since she was um, made the head of African American outreach in the White House at that time in 2016. But you know, this wouldn't be the first time a Black prominent individual has employed linguistic features for this purpose of media. In the book, Articulate While Black, I know you're gonna be reading a Lehman Smitherman. Um, they argue that uh, President Barack Obama code switches in order to connect with black audiences. And maybe if any of you have watched the vice presidential debate, you might've noticed Senator Kamala Harris doing some strategic linguistic moves like this. And Kelly will talk more about this uh, as we move on to the institution of politics. But all in all, these examples of media illustrate the relationship between language ideologies ideologies and indexicality in these venues, which are full of data at the fingertips of linguistic researchers. So Rachel has just given us some great examples of how this works in visual and spoken media. So I'd like to talk to you about print media. Uh, I built a corpus of sports journalism, 8.5 million words to trace descriptions of 120 athletes over 108 years. I used machine learning techniques that are actually quite simple. <laughs> if you're interested, please ask me questions um, to map the semantic field of sports journalism and show that black athletes race confines their descriptions to a subset of this semantic field. And this is what we call racialization. So words have become racialized when they are used over time with the same race of an actor and pick up a new semantic sense. So much like spam the food became spam the email, right? So one uh, classic example of how this works is with the mediated descriptions of Serena Williams. So all of these words here represent kind of a confluence of uh, language ideologies and stereotypes that come together in the description of Serena Williams. So of course we have angry, right? As Rachel has already mentioned, it's, a, it's something that black women get described as. Um, we also have a beast, insatiable and ferocious. Um, my findings pattern with uh, previous literature to show that African Americans are described using animalistic terms instead of skill based terms. Um, and then we also have unstoppable and violent, which really point uh, to the racialization in this specific media talking about sports journalism. So Serena Williams is called the goat, the greatest of all time at the age of 22. And this is an example of what we call semantic intensity. So we use intensity um, when we talk about all sorts of things, like when we say that pizza is sacred. Um, but what's going on here is really an avoidance of the and she's black construction, right? So Serena Williams was young, she was incredible. She was from Compton and she was doing all of these things in a very white space. So her blackness absolutely made her exceptional, but the media couldn't talk about it directly in this way. So you get these other words that really push the top of the semantic ceiling upward. It's a confluence of linguistic um, and social ideologies that really power this inflation and the subsequent racialization of these terms. So just today, I saw a commercial with Simone Biles, who is being called the goat at 23. All right, so these things that happened to Serena Williams first now have affected all black female athletes coming up after her. So um, we've talked about the media creating characters and covering events. But of course, as Rachel alluded to with her discussion of Omarosa, the media also covers politics. And we want to take a moment to discuss a bit deeper about how these trends and in representation inform how politicians construct themselves and subsequently how audiences react to them. So a few short weeks ago, we had uh, the Democratic National Convention and the vice presidential debate. 
Um, and so here we have a tweet from Nicole Holiday, who's saying that she's going to spend today and tomorrow carefully counting the number of times people call this senator and former attorney general articulate as though they are shocked that she can string words together. Um, so what's happening with articulate here is really an example of how racial-linguistic ideologies function. So these go back to the start of this talk at the interface of social knowledge and moment to moment parsing capabilities. Racial linguistic ideologies shape our interactional expectations, our behavioral expectations and our character expectations. So you see a person walking down the street towards you in this mythical land where we're outside and there are other people. Right. And as this person is walking towards you, you see, you know, their gait and what they're wearing and also their color and their gender and their age and all these other things that you've noticed about them as they're walking towards you. And all of that information starts to shape how you would imagine interacting with this person. Like, am I going to say hello? Am I going to smile? Am I going to just keep walking? And if you do that, what behavior would you expect? We also start to build up like what kind of person this is based on like what they're wearing and what they're doing and when and where we are, right? So the usage of articulate in this instance really belies the violation of a behavioral expectation, right? So there's a stereotype that black people are not well-educated and therefore not well-spoken. And so when you encounter a black person in the world who doesn't sound like a minstrel from television, um, that you put this description up top, like this person, they're very articulate. I don't want your behavioral expectations to be violated violated down the line. So I'm telling you right now that they sound good. Um, so Liam and Smitherman, who you're going to be reading soon, have a whole book about this. And they also wrote this op-ed that Nicole Holiday is linking us to. And please stay tuned uh, to Nicole Holiday's work. She's developing a project on Kamala Harris right now. Um, so Senator Harris became um, the first US politician to use a Tamil word in a public forum um, during the Democratic National Convention. Um, she mentioned her aunties and her chitis, right? Um, and she's able to signal these different groups by using different words, right? And it reminds us that we are never just one thing. Um, and that what variation does is it gives us mobility um, between our groups to signal our various belongings, right? So she broke Twitter just by saying one word that really was full of representation for an entire class of people. And that's really because language is who we are materially, right? So when we think about indexicality, we often think about it as just a feature variation in our speech, but it really involves the whole body. Um, so we have Megyn Kelly remarking after the vice presidential debate uh, to Kamala Harris, like, don't smirk, don't shake your head. And what that, this belies is really a misunderstanding of the embodied expression of black womanhood. Um, and so we were reminded that identity is realized in the moment across multiple modalities and involves stance taking. Awesome, thanks Kelly. As Kelly just spoke about misunderstandings and varied perceptions in politics, it's particularly important to recognize that these mismatches um, also happen in the institution of law, which maintains the ideological separation between mainstream speakers and minoritized speakers at times with lethal consequences. People have been condemned legally, fired from their jobs for using their home language in their place of business, such as the case of Arizona, where Navajo was banned from being used at a particular restaurant and four employees were fired for not signing the contract um, for this ban. Additionally, translation errors or failures can result in negative court outcomes, such as the case of using Aboriginal English in Australia. So in one example, a defendant referred to the half moon shining on the night of a particular crime, and the opposing counsel said there was no half moon that night and thus invalidating the testimony. But an interpreter in the courtroom pointed out that half actually means small part in the witness's dialect, which followed by the witness drawing the moon that he saw, which ended up validating his testimony. This shows how crucial linguistically well-versed interpreters are in the courtroom setting, um, as, as his linguistic knowledge was crucial to the case. Additionally, we know that even the tiniest contrastive differences in language can lead to consequences in the courtroom. 
looking at examples of Jamaican Creole in the UK, a witness in a particular crime said that when she heard the bap bap, she dropped to the ground and started to run. But this was mistranscribed as I dropped the gun and then I run, um, which first of all, um, drop goes from intransitive to transitive here and um, they transcribe, the, the transcriber changed it from an indefinite article to a preposition. Now these two words, um, ground and gun, may be phonologically similar, though not identical in Jamaican Creole. Um, I've put a um, transcription there on the third bullet if you're interested. Um, but this again shows us the need for translators in the courtroom. Coming back to the US, if you look at these images here, there are upsettingly too many examples of discrediting African-American English speakers in the courtroom from Anita Hill, who's at the top in the Clarence Thomas Supreme Court uh, appointment hearings to Rachel Gentel on the bottom left in the Trayvon Martin murder trial to on the right, um, the, uh, sorry. Um, and then I don't have pictured here, but we did earlier, um, Senator Kamala Harris, um, who uh, spoke in the Kavanaugh trial um, and on the debate stage and was judged extremely right in these spaces. And then of course, uh, Sandra Bland here. Um, we've had decades of audiences, Supreme Court members and juries finding testimonies of black women not credible or inauthentic and at worst incomprehensible. Outside of the courtroom, perceptions of black women's speech can have life-threatening consequences. In the killing of an angry black woman, Sandra Bland in their politics of, the politics of respectability by Gill in 2015, uh, a description of Sandra Bland's um, murder is put forth with a critical eye toward the legality of her arrest. And at the time of her arrest, Bland was pulled over but did not get out of her car or put her cigarette out when the officer asked her to. She said things like, I'm in my car, why do I have to put out my cigarette? And you seem very irritated to the officer. This idea of Bland being a threatening individual already existed because of the stereotypes that say black women are inherently belligerent um, and thus it is the expectation that the black woman will be hard to control. Thus we see here the death of a perceived angry black woman resulting from the discourse between her and the officer. All these examples showcase the need for anti-racist and sociolinguistic competence on behalf of all actors in the legal system. One of my most valued research prongs actually is looking at emotional prosody processing of African-American English speech, which I'd be glad to talk to with you about um, sometime during the question period. Thank you, Rachel. Um, these things are also very, very important to my heart. It's what made me want to become a linguist. Um, but yeah, so the current state of our legal system is a total mess, but fear not, uh, it's in <laughs> instantiation was also completely screwed up, right? So I wanna talk to you a little bit about uh, citizenship and language and how these things are related in the early years of our constitution. There are a whole host of cases to discuss, but I'm just gonna touch on one of them, in re ah, yup. Um, I've got it linked here. It's very short, it's about eight pages long. And I think it's important, if not crucial, to read the language of this case as it gives a pretty stark example of the rhetorical gymnastics the framers of our modern institutions engaged in to weave biological and scientific racism into the Constitution. So in our Constitution, still to this day, a citizen is uh, defined as a fair complexioned person of European descent. So Mr. Yup, in this case, is Chinese. And he tries to naturalize because he is light skinned, he's fair complexioned, he passes the paper bag test. Um, but the arguments against his claim say, quote, white person does not refer to color of skin, but instead an understanding in popular speech acquired in the literature or common parlance. So in front of the Supreme Court, a direct line is being drawn between whiteness and language a line that is stronger than whiteness and skin color. So we have 230 years of group-based amendments to the citizenship um, through this process of naturalization since the 1790 Naturalization Act. Um, so a quote from another case says, lesser peoples of Europe, the Germans, Irish, and Poles, can count as white because they quickly merge and lose the distinct hallmarks of their heritage, while Hindus retain marks of ethnicity indefinitely, particularly in accent. And this quote is very important because it reveals an acknowledgement by the Supreme Court that race is socially constructed and also shows that dark skin and accent are intimately connected. 
So over time in our history, as more people who sound less standard and are therefore less white because they're intimately connected are brought in, they are encouraged to assimilate. Right? But what this quote also reveals is that assimilation can only progress to a point for some of these non-white groups. And this leads to deficit models. So a deficit model, the definition of it is um, a model where deviations from the typical are seen as something needing to be fixed and that this is the fault of an individual or group. And there is no better place for us to discuss the effects of deficit models than the education system. So the standing policy to this day of the American education system is the acquisition of standard spoken English through which the preservation of American ideals is guaranteed. And we find that this standing policy um, is really developed during the late 19th and early 20th century during this uh, era of US imperialism. At this time, we gain um, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines um, through like regular colonialist means, and then California, Texas, and New Mexico through settler colonialism. And all of this collides with American Indian policy and Jim Crow laws on the stage of education. So as all of these people from these very different linguistic and cultural backgrounds are brought into the United States, um, some of them quite forcibly, we you know, sort of smush them all together on this education stage and you know, calamity ensues. Kelly's great introduction of deficit models provides a nice segue for us to talk about signed languages and the way um, they're positioned as a deficiency alongside spoken languages, which aren't talked about much and we haven't been talking about much today. We've been talking predominantly about spoken language. So there are many varieties of sign languages all over the world. And you can learn more about that, different kinds of sign languages at spreadthesign.com. Um, specifically in the United States, we've struggled to give due diligence to signers and sign languages as ideologies purport spoken language as being better than signed. You may also have heard or seen baby sign language before um, or used before a child starts speaking. The sign languages are often uh, encouraged for hearing children to learn them, but discouraged for deaf children. Generally, many deaf children are discouraged from signing and hearing aid attempts have been the first choice. Um, Alexander Graham Bell played a very serious role in the isolation of signing individuals during his life, isolating deaf children and taking them out of the day schools or the overnight schools and having them be taught by hearing teachers with the purpose of banning sign language altogether. And unfortunately, these kinds of efforts to eradicate sign language has maintained to this day. As recently as this summer, UCLA researchers have created high-tech gloves that can turn sign languages into speech in real time, despite other research showing us that sign language gloves don't help, sign, don't help signing in deaf people. Gratefully, efforts like Spread the Sign are great and hopeful indicators that sign languages are being framed in a positive light and hopefully will be in the future. Thank you, Rachel. Really can't stress enough how terrible of a person Alexander Graham Bell was. Yeah. So um, we have this quote here, the way black language is devalued in schools reflects how black lives are devalued in the world from April Baker Bell's uh, book, Linguistic Justice, which came out this year. Um, and in response to the uprising for Black Lives this summer, Baker Bell and colleagues issued these demands for Black linguistic justice that are linked here. We don't have time to discuss them fully, and we hope we'll read through, you'll read through them on your own time. But I wanted to highlight two cases around Black English and the education system that really underscore why these demands are so necessary. So in 1974, another case came before the Supreme Court, it's Lau v. Nichols, and the outcome of this case creates a federal mandate for English language learning education. So any school district that had a certain percentage of students that were speakers of a language other than English had to now provide equitable education opportunities for these students who were previously being segregated or sent to their own schools. So in both of these cases, Ann Arbor and Oakland, Black students were also being segregated. They were being placed into special ed classes and labeled as neuroatypical because their first language was not standard English. So these cases, these, uh, they take two different approaches. 
the Ann Arbor case seeks to extend Lau v. Nichols to dialects. They bring in a number of specialists and they demonstrate that the distinction between a language and a dialect is an institutional one, that it has nothing to do with the structure and function of a language. Um, and that obviously doesn't happen. Lau v. Nichols isn't extended um, and they just introduce new pedagogy um, to the Ann Arbor school system. And then in Oakland, a few years later, which is the famous Black English case, um, these lawyers seek instead to define English as its own, Black English as its own language. Um, and so therefore it would be uh, eligible for the protections Lau v. Nichols already had put in place. And both of these approaches fail. Right. And we find that today black English speakers still do not enjoy equal protection in schools that is afforded to their English language learning peers. And this, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> really reflects the failing of an education system which doesn't take linguistic discrimination into account. It is completely ignored in our history lessons and it is also not inform, um, allowed to and critically inform pedagogy. So next we're gonna talk about housing, which I have researched extensively as you know. Um, so when the federal government created the FDIC, they developed a set of guidelines for banks to use to guarantee home loans. So these guidelines were based on the proximity of a house to industry, I'm, I'm count, industry, toxic waste or <laughs> black and indigenous people of color. Um, and so this process is called redlining, right? So here we have a map of Detroit um, where you can see that the city has been cut up into four colors. I know that the difference between green and blue is a little hard to see on this map. You'll just have to trust me. Um, so as it turns out, all of these red uh, areas are the areas where black people were living in this city. So my work sought to determine if the effects of redlining are still present um, or still persist to the present day in the housing market. I audited 90 properties calling with three different dialects, Muse, mainstream US English or standard, um, a Southern American voice and African American language to determine if these neighborhoods um, maintain their exclusivity and to determine if practices which are explicitly forbidden under the Fair Housing Act are measurable. And so skipping <laughs> a lot of detail about this study, what I find is that white voices fare better overall. So the Muse voice and the Southern American voice were both normed as white, people hear them as white voices. Um, and the AL voice then is doubly marked for race and non-standardness. So what that looks like is lower commitment levels from landlords. People don't make traditional appointments with you. They tell you to call them back and then don't answer. They direct you to the website. Um, and steering. And steering is explicitly illegal under the Fair Housing Act. Um, and what that looks like is say that I call about a house um, using the AL voice in like a blue neighborhood, which is right underneath green, which is the top. Um, and they give me some detail about that apartment, but then they say, you know, I've got this other one that's at this other place and tell me all these good things about it. But that other place is gonna be in like a yellow or red neighborhood. So they're directly steering me out of a wider neighborhood into a neighborhood of color. So what we can conclude from this study is that discrimination on the basis of voice is possible and that dialect speakers remain unprotected in this market. Yes, exactly, Kelly. And like the housing market, the healthcare system, which is the last institution we'll speak on today, is fraught with issues of language and discrimination, dealing with vulnerable populations uh, where discriminatory outcomes may directly affect people's physical health outcomes. We can see this from hospitals to primary care physician interactions to abortion clinics. For example, we've seen in California that some hospitals institute an English only rule where healthcare workers are not allowed to use their home language, such as Tagalog, for example, at any time at work, even during breaks. Now, Dr. Ashley Hessen, someone near and dear to us because she is at Michigan or was at Michigan, uh, is an amazing linguist, but also has an MD in fraternal fetal medicine. 
And her work in linguistics has focused on specific linguistic mismatches, such as the misinterpretation of the word, I don't know, the words, I don't know, which have been shown to result in imprecise diagnoses and even dissent between providers and patients. This can of course be modulated by race, gender, and other factors. Then comes into play the issues of equitable access to resources. Ella Van Hess at the University of Ghent uses linguistic ethnography to probe the question of equal access to abortion care in a Belgian health clinic, finding that individuals who speak Dutch or French are provided multiple options for abortion versus Arabic speaking individuals who are offered limited options. All of these are examples here um, to really make you think about what is at stake in healthcare with respect to language and discrimination. As we sum up, we hope that these domains we've discussed today and the expanded examples we've included can give evidence to this heavy history of linguistics and colonization. We want to include this great uh, Twitter slide, I think maybe an Instagram from Anne Poo London, um, which goes over the defiling of minoritized languages resulting from the quest of imperialism. So what can we do about it? Well, we believe there are a few concrete steps that you can take forward, such as, First, we believe that every linguist ought to see it as a moral and professional imperative to do anti-racist work in our discipline. Given our expertise on language, we as linguists bear the greatest responsibility to examine not only how language functions as an object of study, but how this object interfaces with the systems our societies, societies create. This also means thinking about what it means to be an ideal or native speaker in an increasingly multilingual world, what the terms we use for people mean and assume and who they implicate. As we begin to use experimental methods in linguistics, we need to think critically about using minoritized language varieties of study so that we can do better science that is representative of the language faculty in general, um, showing us what the language faculty in general is capable of processing, not just with respect to standard language at a given time. And finally, Though it's not widely believed that language is a signal of who we are or where our roots lie, it's also not common to believe that discrimination based on language is akin to discrimination based on identity or community. And we've shown here that it very much is, right? And so this is why we call on you academics and researchers to be empowered in your positions so that we can make perceptible change in our field and in the world. And with that, we wanna thank you again for having us here and please feel free to reach out to us if you would like more information. And we wanna thank especially Katie Carmichael for inviting us to a VTLX class visit. And now we're happy to open it up for questions and our slides are available at this link.